What's the Difference podcast is brought to you by the You Suck Podcasting Network. Featuring Alex Whiteley and Tom Bruno. From either side of the pond, they discuss the subtle differences between US and UK culture. In a bid to build a bridge over the Atlantic, we speak to people from all walks of life. So sit down, grab a drink, and enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome to What's the Difference podcast. I am Tom Bruno, and I'm joined as always by my lovely British co-host. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for the intro. I'm Alex Whiteley. Thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> so today I'm going to take the reins because if there's been a common theme of the show, it is Tom can't let go of his past. He just is a nostalgia fiend, and at any given chance where he can bring somebody who meant the world to him or something, somebody that was attached, somebody, somebody that created something even. It, I have to take the attempt or make the attempt at least to talk to these people because they influenced my life so much for the better or worse. Um, today, we have one of those people. Um, before, it was Mark Summers, of course. You know, he was an amazing, amazing guest. Today actually might top that for me, Alex. I'm not going to lie, dude. Like, you know, it, it's, it's a really hard thing to say because you don't ever want to disparage anybody for anything. And once again, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. But when I think of my childhood, there's a couple things that really pop up into my head right off the bat. One of those things being Batman, the animated series that no one from that show was on this today. But the other thing that influenced everything, my adult movie watching and not the dirty kind, like the actual like <laughs> movie watching, um, my career choice up until the point where I had kids, my love of scary stories, all stemmed from this amazingly charming uh, kids horror show back in the early 90s. And we happen to be very, very lucky to have the creator of that show on today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DJ McHale. Hey. Hello. I'm going to give you a clap. I'm going to give you a clap. because hey. Yeah, I think I'm going to applaud that too. <laughs> well done, Tom. That was, that Who's was this fun. guy? Uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have to say as well, um, I, I, I believe you that this is more important to you than, than the Mark Summers thing because when Are You Afraid of the Dark was was... Uh, rebooted last year we couldn't get this guy to shut up about it he was like I, i'm having to i'm having to take my daughter through the old are you afraid of the darks uh in preparation for the new ones just to see uh what her reaction would be to the older stuff you know um it was it was a, a passion project to yours for a while wasn't it tom yeah, well, I, I wanted her to have an understanding of like, you know, not everything is penny wise. No, it, it, a lot of this stuff, like there's some really, not not today so much, like uh, the new reboot, are, which you had something to do with, right, DJ? You were um, pretty involved in the new Are You Afraid of the Dark? Very little. Very little? Very little uh, Other than the fact that my partner and I created the show, uh, zero. Zero. Okay. Well, that's fine because you you gave the you gave the original for what this would be sent off, and it's it, they're not they're similar in a sense that there's like a, a story, but the, but the old series was anthology based. Like you know, there was a different story every single time. And this one had a continuation story that kind of played through the entirety of the run. Um, but I wanted her to see what I grew up on, especially because there's a lot of scary episodes. Like, I mean, I'm an adult now, so I kind of have a, you know, I'm not scared of the ghastly grinner anymore, but like as a kid, things like that were terrifying. There were, there were so many episodes DJ that were like, so borderline, like, like, like crazy scary. Um, the night shift, a lot of the vampire stuff was, was something that I was like, wow, th this was for kids. They made this for kids. And no wonder I had nightmares until I was like six. Where, where did the idea come from DJ? Like the, the whole uh, show. Well, it, it uh, you know, I've said this story a lot. Hopefully whoever's watching this hasn't heard it before. So I'll, so uh, pretend that if you have, pretend you haven't. Um, uh, my partner, Ned Candle, and I, uh, we worked on a TV series back in the late 80s called um, Encyclopedia Brown, Boy Detective, which is based on the book series. So, <laughs> do you remember the books or do you remember the yes. series? Both, the books, both. The books Once right. again, DJ, you, you without knowing it, you're like my surrogate father. Apparently, I'm just talking <laughs> all sorts of things <laughs> that I should that I just learn. Or maybe through. I'm your no. no. <laughs> Woo -hoo. The, the uh, awesome. and it was actually kind of funny how uh, Ned produced that series, uh, 
And we met on that series. And the funny thing about it was that he was looking for a writer to translate these books into a, a series. And he saw an ABC after school special that I wrote, which was a really earnest story, which they all are, frankly, an earnest story about separation of church and state with a Jewish girl and a, and a, a Christian guy at Christmas time. They're a couple. And is it right to have uh, uh, religious displays on public property? You know, it was a really earnest type thing. It, it, nothing fun about it. I mean, it was straight ahead stuff. And somehow he extrapolated between that earnest, important story. And there was a Holocaust survivor in it. Uh, um, he somehow made it said, I bet this is the guy that can translate a mystery about a little boy detective solving crimes. I don't know how he made that connection, but he was right, frankly. Uh, so, so I wrote the Encyclopedia Brown series and, uh, and we decided, we said, you know, we could, we, we could probably do something on our own. You know, the, the, that was a property that preexisted us. And there was another guy that owned the rights to that. And we said, let's try to come up with something on our own. And Ned and a couple of his other partners had created a thing called, um, Greatest sports legends. These guys are big into sports TV. And uh, it was a compilation video. Remember, this is back 1990. Right? <laughs> this is the old days. So it was a video, VHS video yeah. of, of highlights, sports highlights, greatest sports legends. And they had a deal with a cigarette company, of all things, that if you bought a carton of their cigarettes, you'd get this video. Nice. And and, wow. and I'm not saying that the deal he struck was roughly akin to the deal that George Lucas struck with Star Wars for merchandising, <laughs> but I don't think they were paid a whole heck of a lot to make that video, but they got like a certain amount of money off of each sale and they made a lot of money. <laughs> it was ridiculous how, how much money they made off of this thing. So Ned came to me and said, let's come up with an idea that we could do something similar. I mean, not to sell with cigarettes, of course, because we're kids TV. Uh, <laughs> come up with something that, that maybe we can make millions of dollars off of the way I did with Greatest Sports Legends. So, so we came up with this idea, which essentially, this wasn't the title of it, but it was essentially Bedtime Stories for Lazy Parents. Hmm. And, and the idea was you'd get some, we'd get some actor, old familiar actor who was out of work, sit him in a big cushy chair in front of a roaring fireplace with a big book that said fairy tales. And he would read the fairy tales and we'd record them. And so the idea is if a parent didn't feel like reading to their kid, if you guys have kids, you know what it's like when there's a two-year-old that keeps saying, another story. Um, they'd say, <laughs> and, oh, again. Yeah. and again, or read the same story over again. So <laughs> you pop this video into the VCR and or VHS and hit play and say, good night. And that was it. Uh, which was kind of a good idea. And until yeah. it, the question was, okay, what stories are they going to be? You know, we're going to do three little pigs, little red riding hood. You know, it all just seems so dull and done and we had to do public domain. It was just crappy. So Ned asked me the key question, which was what kind of stories did you like when you were a kid? And I said, I liked scary stories because I really did. So it's like, oh, okay, that's different. So suddenly fairy tales became scary tales. Mm -hmm. And then, but then it was kind of odd to have some grandfatherly type guy reading scary stories to kids, you know, on the, <laughs> for, for, that was weird. So it's like, okay, that guy's going away. So where do you tell scary stories? It's like, well, how about sitting around a campfire? Duh. So now we have kids telling stories around the campfire. And then it took the next step of, well, why do we just have to tell the stories? Why don't we actually see the stories? So suddenly with that moment, the budget went, whoop. Suddenly it was no longer a direct-to-video inexpensive thing to produce. Suddenly it became a television project. And that we took to Nickelodeon and the rest is history. So that was kind of the pre-existence of the show evolution that led to the show. Which is and, and, and very... the, the title was Scary Tales. Scary Tales? Uh, that's yeah. that's and, smart. It's very clever. Well, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, I got, and I got to say, the decision to take the grandfather out, because we know that works as well. Jim Henson had a similar show um, in the 90s where they played out like uh, old fables, and there was a gentleman that read with a, with a dog puppet or whatever. But the idea to have um, 
kids tell the story was made it far more relatable because even myself as like a six year old kid, I'm like, oh, these are kids just like me. Me and my friends could be the Midnight Society sitting around and we planned on doing it. That was the worst part is because, you know, because we had Are You Afraid of the Dark, we didn't need to go out in the woods and tell scary <laughs> stories. We're like, what do you mean? We don't need to get bit by mosquitoes. The stories are right here. <laughs> right. Well, it, you know, the funny thing about that Midnight Society is that when I came up with that concept, I came up with it for all of the right reasons. And history has proven that, and, and you just gave one example, that it, w- it was the right reason. This is an anthology show. And it's tough selling an anthology show because every week it's a new cast. So what is what is the common denominator that people are going to be coming back to? So you have a storyteller. Um, and it's kids' storytellers. And it, But the fact that I, I made the decision for the right reasons, I then immediately discounted the value of it. Because for me, the fun of the shows, the fun of the episodes had nothing to do with the Midnight Society. It was, okay, we got to the Midnight Society, submit for the approval, okay, fine. Now let's get into the movie. And, and even from a production point of view, that was where the real challenge was. So I, almost, I just discounted. Once I put the value up here at the Midnight Society, I then for the run of the show, I discounted the value of the Midnight Society. Turns out I was my initial instinct was correct because whenever people talk about the show they're talking about the midnight society yes and i still want to say really (laughs) it's just kids in the campfire what it's so much so that people are saying well we don't like some of the episodes because it's a different midnight society and i'm like well who cares it's it's interesting it's interesting. Well, for two reasons. One, because they're like me. You know, they're they're used to what they saw. They love their childhood, so they don't want to see. But the thing is, though, is that TV does not make things for you. They make things for you to a certain age, and after that, they don't count on you watching anymore. So they got to bring in new people to give them that feeling that they're still with them. That these kids are still telling stories to kids, not the you know twenty year old Frank is telling kids. You know, once again, you come back to the thing where the grandfather's telling stories, and it's weird again. Yeah, well, and it's it, it kind of to say it bugs me is too strong, but but it, with you know social media being so omnipresent now, uh, you know, back in those days, you didn't hear anybody talking about your show, it, mm-hmm. you know, unless you actually yeah. physically saw somebody and you know, like, hey, you make that show, I like that show. Now with social media, it's all over the place, so I'm seeing all the stuff being written about the show and whatnot, and I'm just so amazed that people don't like. I'm making a very broad umbrella statement here, like the last couple of seasons of the show. And a lot of the reasons is because they don't like the, the midnight society was different. Mm. And like, mm. so if those same kids were the original midnight society, they would have been better. <laughs> you know, it's just that like change wasn't good. I mean, do you so think, do you think that's down to like, you know, that you know how the Harry Potter fans are kind of, grown up with harry potter and it gets to a point where they're, they're older kids no more so they ain't taking the same crap no more they're not like they're like oh no 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 no. do you think it's that that's the original core fan base grew up a little bit and then now they're like those pesky kids they call them the midnight society do you think that's what it could be i think that's a huge part of it because yeah. that show ran the, the pilot first aired in 1991 and the last original episode first run aired in 2000. So that's nine years. So someone who started watching that show when they were 10 years old, they're suddenly 19 years old. And, and they're not, they have different sensibilities. It's not the thing. And, and also I'll say probably, I, I think I'm right on this. I, I can't point to any facts. This is just my guess. Is that really the kind of, the really the height of the popularity of the show it was probably around 1993, 1994. So that's where the bulk of people, you know, the millions were, were watching the show. Mm. So now you get to 1999, that core group is changed. Like you just said, it, they, they've changed. They have different sensibilities. So they look at this and they're expecting to get the same experience they got when they were 10. Mm. It's not the same anyway. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's different, so therefore, it's not good. It's like, yeah, it's well, it's, it is just as good, but the show is not for you anymore. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. It's no. not for you. It's for the new crop 10 year olds who are, who are coming up. You'd have to start telling stories like the, the story of the boy who didn't get a date and things like that. They got to change it so abruptly or, yeah. or the cell phone bill that was too high. Oh, you yeah. know, you, you can't keep the same thing because the same things don't scare you. I mean, I, I grew up and I realized that, you know, some, a lot of this stuff is not 
the case. It's not scary because it's not true, but it works on kids, of course, because kids don't know if it's true or not. That's what it, why it's so brilliant because you don't know what goes bump in the dark. It's, yeah. it's all mystery still, and there's so much wonder as a kid. It, it works so incredibly well. Um, Kenny brought up a very valid point. Um, Kenny, our, our beautiful man who keeps us honest, and he brings up all the, uh, the good points we should be bringing up. Um, the cast of Are You Afraid of the Dark was very diverse, so incredibly diverse. You had a person represented for almost every facet of life. Was that your decision? Uh, yeah, uh, not alone. Um, both Ned and I were very much about I mean, this sounds like I'm, you know, paying lip service, but we're all about diversity. It's like, that's the point we need to show. It, it, so I'll give as much credit to us, to Nickelodeon as I'll give to us, because Nickelodeon was definitely about diversity. And this is, and, you know, people being concerned about diversity it didn't start yesterday. <laughs> this is going back into the early 90s. Um, so I, I am very proud to say that not, not just with the Midnight Society, but with the, the cast of each show, um, we're showing interracial couples. We're showing we we didn't get into to LGBTQ kind of stuff, but but um, that may have been a little too much for young minds. I, I guess I don't know, but whatever. But in terms of, you know, there were a couple of times, even the first season, where I I'm a white guy. I I, I can't write the true experience of being a person of color, but what I can do is I can cast people of color. Yes. So, so we write the shows semi generically. I mean, these were social statement shows generically. Then we make sure in the casting process that we would we would have a full diverse cast. And in the very first season, we had an interracial couple. I remember Ned and I had a conversation once. It's like, are we going to get flack for this? Mm-hmm. And the immediate answer was, maybe. Who cares? It's the right thing to do. And in fact, the show, we were actually, I love saying it, we were nominated for an NAACP Image Award uh, for doing just that. Um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm proud of that. And, and that was, I don't want to give all the credit to Ned and I, but certainly we have that sensibility. But Nickelodeon pushed it a lot. And, and in fact, I, in all honesty, there are many times where I pushed back on it, not because I didn't want a diverse cast, but I wanted the best possible cast. Mm. And and it wasn't always possible to to cast people of color in the part. So so a lot of times I had to take a step back and say, okay, what's more important here? Uh, and and we always went with the the, the diversity. Um, so can I, so can I ask as well about um, being PC in the nineties as well? Because the nineties was a different era. Okay, you can get away with it. Tend to get a lot away with a lot. But I mean, things were starting to change. Um, but you could definitely get away with a lot more in the nineties. Was that a task for you guys to, to write something that wasn't going to be trodden on for, for its, its content? Uh, you, you would think, <laughs> but <laughs> no, um, the most pushback we got along those lines was in the very, very beginning when, when we first pitched it to Nickelodeon, when we first pitched it to them, they just said, now we're not talking about diversity. Now we're talking about scary. Mm. Um, they just said they rejected the show. It's like you cannot do this. This is wow. this is beyond the. It's, you can't do scary for kids unless it's Scooby Doo. <laughs> you know you can't, you can't do scary for kids, and Yikes. so they threw us out. <laughs> and uh, it, over a period of like a year, where we thought the show was dead, um, a uh, a new development executive was hired at Nickelodeon. His name was Jay Mulvaney, who a guy who I'll forever uh, uh, love. He's actually passed away. But um, he, in his role of development executive, he went through back some of the old files to say, looking at stuff that, that was rejected. He pulled out my little three-page proposal and said, how come we're not doing this? And so they called us back in to say, let's think about it. But I still had to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, I, had a writ- I had written one script as a, a, a pilot to, be a, you know, to show that could work, plus the mythology of how it's all going to work. And they're like, okay, that's good, but can you do it again? So then I had to write two more scripts to show this is where we're thinking of going with it, just to show that, look, we're not, as much as it's called a horror anthology show, it's not that horror. I mean, it's, there's, there's no blood and guts. There's no real violence. I mean, yes, people do die. And my, my answer, my comment to that was, if you want to have a ghost story, somebody has to die. <laughs> because if nobody dies, there ain't no ghost. Um, 
So, so I really had to jump through a lot of hoops creatively to prove that it could be done. Then even on top of that, they kind of gave me not so much a mandate, but a, but a request to say, could you please, in coming up with the stories, can you try to base them on literary antecedents? I mean, things that classic literature, short stories, things that we know so that when parents come after us with pitchforks and torches to say, what are you doing? We could say, this is classic literature. What are you, what are you crazy? Um, so, so much so that, that I, it didn't even dawn on me until recently. I thought, oh, yeah, right. The, the, very, the pilot episode that we shot, there, there were three scripts that I wrote that they could choose from. And they were like, which one do you want? They picked this one called The Tale of Twisted Claw. And it is, it, it's a retelling of the monkey's paw. <laughs> it is, so. it's what it is. I mean, the details are different, but the concept is the same. So I think that's why they picked that one. Um, and there are several, I go through so many of the shows were based on their antecedents. As it turns out, we did not need to do that. We never got pushed back. And maybe because you, like you said, Alex, they can get away with more stuff in the nineties, but yeah. we never got grief from anyone. And again, maybe today things have changed more so today. And, People have more of a voice today just because of social media. So who knows? Maybe we would have, if social media existed back then, maybe we would have heard more grief. But there wasn't the engine to show grief back then or give people a hard time. So yeah. we just did whatever we wanted to do with by the it, reason. By the time it aired, you know, and they sent, you know, hate mail, you're already like six months out. And you're like, well, sorry, it's already gone. So I guess you have to live with it. Um, yeah. was, was there ever an episode that didn't air based on just how scary it was? Or you're like, ooh, we like, kids can't see this. There's no way it's going to go. Or maybe even a subject matter that just wouldn't fly. Um, only the, the easy answer is no, except I have one, one that's kind of an interesting, uh, in light of being in the UK, actually. Um, usually that filtering process for lack of a better term happened at the script stage where I, I didn't have a writing staff. Uh, mm. I, I'm the writing staff because you don't need a staff when every story is so completely different. Yeah. There didn't need to be consistency of characters and the, there weren't any big overall arcs. You know, it wasn't like a typical TV show. It was an anthology other than the Midnight Society. So rather than hire writers, I would, with each season, I put a call out for script ideas, for story ideas. So people would pitch me story ideas. And then if I like the story idea, I'd hire that person to write it and I'd write it with them. Um, so, there was a lot of times in that process where I'd say, Ooh, we can't go there. That, that's not, mm. work. we can't do that. Like, for example, uh, even going back to uh, literary antecedent things, I tried to find an Edgar Allan Poe story that we might be able to translate to Are You Afraid of the Dark? No. There were two. There were no. two incidents. Just Unless you're the Simpsons. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Let the Simpsons do that. It'll be fine. Mm. Um, I, I tried to get a version of Frankenstein. It just didn't fly the the uk story is interesting and and um when it was licensed in the uk whatever year it was 93 94 something like that um the broad and i'm forgetting what broadcaster was i'm sorry but they came to me and said they're nervous they're like mm, we're putting on a scary show i don't know for kids can we do this and they asked to ask me for a list of episodes that i thought might be suspect that might be a little too scary for kids and that's a tough question to answer because everything's different for everyone. You know, one person's going to think something scary. Some are going to say, hey, who cares? So I gave them a list of, I forgot what the episodes were, you know, three or four episodes. And I thought, no, I've, the feedback I've gotten is that this might be a little scary and whatnot. There was no problem with any of those episodes that I suggested. But they did not air. And they may have subsequently aired it since. But going back then, there, they, there was one episode they didn't air. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Um, I, I know you guys don't know all the episodes, but um, I do. It was, oh, I oh, do. do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. DJ, DJ, I bought them. I went to Canada with my wife when I was like, I've been married for 10 years. Uh, one of our first like big trips, we went to Canada and they had all the box sets available in Canada because it was a Canadian show. So I bought them all right there on the spot. I was like, oh, oh, oh this is my souvenir. My wife's like, are you fucking crazy? Whatever. Uh, I am very, very, very familiar, sir. Please, what was the episode? There's the tale of the full moon. Yeah. Oh, that was the uh, werewolf episode with the uh, with the with the uh, neighbor that was eating the pets, and his uh, brother was a werewolf. Yeah, I have no idea what was that episode. I'm so uh, sorry. Was- I'm unfamiliar. <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, you're right, and it starred. Uh, so, so, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, to, for the life of me, I don't know why they would pick that one. 
it wasn't particularly scary. Um, it's, I'm it's actually maybe, one of the funnier episodes because it's really got this uh, kind of comical mother figure. She's like a 1950s kind of like boppy. It, it's very interesting. And it's so much like at the very end, uh, spoilers for anyone that hasn't seen this 30 year old show, but the, uh, the mom gets with the uh, next door neighbor whose brother is a werewolf and the son's throwing a stick to him like he's a dog and they're wearing like Hawaiian t-shirts. Yeah, it's it's very. It was written and directed by a good friend of mine who did a lot of episodes, Ron Oliver, and that's his mm. sense of humor. I mean, it's a very campy, oh, very different from the other ninety episodes. Um, yes. and, and, but I, I can't believe that's not why why they didn't. I don't, I don't understand it either. I mean, like the UK, it's not as though we didn't have Doctor Who airing at like at dinner time every night. Like that was terrifying for a lot of kids you know the daleks and stuff oh that's crazy i mean i wasn't as aware of i mean i was aware it existed are you afraid of the dark but it wasn't like part of our staple tv because i think it was on nickelodeon it was on nickelodeon which you had to pay for uh with sky or with cable uh which was expensive for a lot of families so you if you had sky uh and you, and you were able to watch sky one and all those channels uh you were privileged you know and um so i'd seen a couple of episodes, but it wasn't part of our staple because we were a five channel family for a while. So <laughs> that's why I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Well, it was well, interesting you bring that up too, because back, back in the nineties, it was on Nickelodeon in the U S too. So, it, and st- back then cable TV was still kind of in its infancy. Mm, yeah. And so the reach of cable homes wasn't that great. It wasn't anywhere near what broadcast TV, does. you know, broadcast is everywhere. Cable, you had to pay for it, like you said. So it, it's actually testament to Nickelodeon and to the show and to, to Snick Block, which is what it was on in Nickelodeon, that, that the show had as many viewers as it did because we, it, we had a very small pool of people who could watch it, yet they were watching. So was- you know, with the full moon, the only thing I can think of, and I'm probably totally wrong on this, is that there was one scene where the two kids, you know, they're trying to figure out if this guy's really a werewolf or not. And they sneak into his house and they open up his fridge and there are all these Tupperware containers with chopped meat. So maybe because it felt like cannibalism. I don't know. <laughs> there was I mean, nothing offensive about that episode. I, I would, or, I or would think... I would think that the fact that they broke into the house might be, which was really, really silly. Because if you watch them, they have this big old crowbar and they're just kind of like right into the house and stuff. It's very entertaining. Um, first of all, uh, so backing up really quick, people pitched you ideas and then you wrote all these episodes, correct? Is that what I took from it? So let me. Uh, well, well, or they would. I would write with it. They would write it, but I would. I'm okay. a showrunner, so I work with them. Okay, Buzzy, because I um, I wanted to make sure I was correct in this because I, I love these stories of death. I really still do go through them when I'm late at night. If I have nothing else to watch, I will go back and rewatch it because it's just so such a fond memory. I usually can pick out where I was. Me and my older sister, Saturday night, you know, we the, the, the amazing Snick lineup, which is also very funny. I'm surprised you guys got any flack at all because Running Stimpy was before you. And maybe, maybe Stimpy, that's why. That, that might I mean, be why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you go back and watch that Running Stimpy show, you'll be like, wow they let billy west say all of this huh no kidding and they're just like yep let it go um yeah when you have a when you have a shot where there's a truck a commercial truck behind the characters and the name of the company is dick liquor yes (laughs) it's just I (laughs) i mean there's some okay so you you went nickelodeon was not nickelodeon back i mean it was nickelodeon don't get me wrong i'm not trying to say that of course it was nickelodeon but it was not the nickelodeon like um superpower that we know of it today and especially in the later 90s early 90s and mid 2000s um at what point did you realize you're like holy shit we're we're reaching so many more people than i ever thought we would with this with this show um, well, I, I don't know if that moment ever happened only because I was so, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So to me, if they said there are 10,000 people watching, there are 10 million people watching, I'd be like, oh, okay, I don't know. I, don't, I had nothing to compare it to. <laughs> um, but I do think that it was right in that moment, like 1992, and I think SNCC was a big part of it, that Nickelodeon exploded. Um, and, and it wasn't just because my show. I was just one of many shows that exploded. I mean, it had been around since the mid-80s. So it had been on for, for eight, nine years at that point. Um, and, and there's a lot that's been written about it in story and song of, of how that was such a golden era. Absolutely. Um, there, there are books written about it. And, and 
it's funny, and I've seen interviews and I've read things and whatnot, that everyone, all the people who made the other shows pretty much have the exact same experience that I have. It's the same story, which is they let the creators create. There yeah. wasn't that kind of corporate overlord that put their finger. Believe me, once Are You Afraid of the Dark was up and running and they're like, okay, people want to watch it. They're like, have fun storming the castle, you know, <laughs> Just drop the shows <laughs> off. and uh, <laughs> That's it. Um, and that was the same with all the shows. So, and then Nick, I think what happened was Nick got successful. And suddenly Boom. money paid a factor. And they were probably the biggest money maker for Viacom. And suddenly when, as Cindy Lauper once said so eloquently, money, money changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly it's it's a profit center for Viacom. And suddenly the really kind of out there creative people kind of went away and the more conservative people came in. And that was kind of the end of the golden era. And what, what's really kept them going to this day is they've created a couple of really fantastic franchises that have yeah. carried them, yeah. like yeah. Rugrats or SpongeBob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that 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 if without those massive franchises, they probably would not be around anymore. Well, I can't say that, but but so so it, it really was a, a a golden era. I love to say that I did an interview recently where I said, you know, it's like we had the golden ticket. Uh, no, actually, we didn't have the golden ticket. We had the orange ticket. <laughs> that orange ticket lets you do whatever you wanted to do, and everybody got a chance to do it. And it was a, and and I love seeing now all the people who are you know '90s kids recognize that, and they're just like, "Wow, that was so awesome." When it came when it came to like casting um, your shows uh, back in the '90s, uh, I mean, the, the the show, whether people knew it back then or not, was a springboard for a lot of big actors doing a lot of shows going on for going forward. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Did it create some sort of casting uh, sort of frenzy with the, you know, the, the starry eyed parents that are trying to push their kids into success? Was it what, what like, like they, they picture on sitcoms and things like that? Was it one of the pushy parents pushing their kids through the door? Stand up straight, make sure your care's combed, you know, what, what was that like for you guys? Uh, you know, I never, I never experienced that. And maybe that was as much a product of the fact that a kid came in, he was there for a week. I would go on a, um, at the beginning of every season, I live in Los Angeles. We shot in Montreal, Canada. And I would go on a junket casting kids. I would start in Los Angeles and I would uh, audition kids. Then I'd go up to Vancouver and audition kids. And then I'd go out to Toronto and audition kids. Then I'd go down to New York and audition kids. And then end up in Montreal where I audition kids. So it was like we were just always <laughs> desperate. And, and not all the kids were that good frankly i mean there's some that were great um but it was sometimes it was just like can you stand up without falling over and remember a line you're in <laughs> barely, <laughs> barely um do you ever like going through your old shows and seeing the like there's a few major stars that were on the show back i mean ryan gosling being one of the more famous the ones that actually you ever go through it and you're like wow i can't believe we got him first and that he, he was on our awesome little show uh, not so much in screening it, but just talking about it. Sure. One of my favorites was uh, Jay Baruchel, who, um, yes, uh, he's done so many things since then. And, uh, he's been on the show like three or four times. Mm. And, and I remember even, I mean, he was, he was in one episode where I drowned him right at the beginning. So he didn't have yes. much to do, <laughs> but then we brought him back for three or four episodes where he actually had to act more. So, and, uh, you can tell even then it's like, this guy's got chops. He's got mm -hmm. comedic chops. He's got a presence. That's why we kept bringing him back. So it's kind of fun. It's it's more fun to see him today and think, oh, yeah, you started with me. I had an experience not that long ago. Um, my office is uh, at a studio in, uh, in Los Angeles. And the show, um, oh, shoot, what's the name of the show? Oh, gosh. It just was canceled recently. Uh, Spider? Um, it was like a spy show. Uh, it was on for four or five years, something like that. And one of the stars of the show was uh, on our Afraid of the Dark episode. Um, really? He's he's the guy who uh, <laughs> I know him best because I don't think I ever saw that show. But but I just he was in the American Pie movies. 
Oh, uh, yes, yes. I was just about to say that to you, too. You had him as well. I, I always call him Shipbrick because that's his name in the, in the movie. That's what they refer to him as. He right. was, um, oh, God, you're going to make me think about Stiff it. Was, <laughs> he, which, which episode was he in? He was in, um, uh, not the phone police. It wasn't definitely it, it not was, that. Uh, oh, the, the crazy camera, the camera episode. Yeah, right, the sure one. Yes, yes. And uh, you got this, DJ. We can remember things. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, and I didn't, I didn't direct that episode. I met him once. I met him in an audition mm. and cast him. And he was great and all that kind of stuff. So a couple of months ago, I was coming out of my, uh, my office. And they, they were setting up shooting a scene in the parking lot in front of my office building. And, uh, and he was sitting there in the chair. You know, this is how many years later, 20 years later. So I went up mm. to him. God, I can't remember his name now. I'm, I'm having a senior moment remembering his name. But um, I went up to him and I said, uh, I remember his name at the time, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, I said, uh, you, 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 you don't know me, but uh, um, I just want you to know that you, know, you were in a, uh, a show of mine uh, a long time ago. And I, I haven't talked to you since, but I, went to, I thought you were fabulous. And he goes, well, what was the show? And I said, uh, it was Are You Afraid of the Dark? And his eyes just lit up and he got, and he gave me this hug and he goes, that was my first gig. Oh, my God. Thank you for doing this. I was, it, was, it was really it was really fun. So a lot of times we cast some of those kids you refer to, it was their first gig. Um, w- w- there was a fun thing that happened where um, when we came back with our final two seasons with that, that new Midnight Society that gets maligned unfairly, mm-hmm. uh, Alicia Cuthbert was uh, in that Midnight Society who's gone on to have done a lot of great things, really terrific girl. And uh, so we cast her to be in the Midnight Society. And um, when we came, went to Montreal, we all came together and she was there on the campfire. She's saying, oh, she watched the show. She's like, well, I know how to do this. And I do the, the flame and the thing, all that kind of stuff. And she said, you know, I was in the show. And I was like, because we had already done 65 episodes. And I was like, really? She goes, oh, yeah, I had a small part in one of the episodes. I said, I don't remember. Who directed it? She said, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I did? Well, I had no memory. It turns out, okay, you remember this since you're so uh, uh, up on things. I do. The episode that we thought was going to be our final episode. We always thought we were going to do 65, and that was it. So mm. the 65th episode was called, you mentioned it before, The Tale of the Night Shift. Yes. About a vampire that's on, on the hunt in a hospital. Or so the good. Night shift. Oh, so good. And I saw that one today. The, okay, so you will, you will appreciate this then. Um, the, the premise was this vampire shipped itself to the hospital and it is a shape-shifting vampire. So the sh- it could change itself into various characters to lure in the victims. And there's one scene where um, there's a nurse and she's leaving the room and she hears a giggle and she turns around and at the end of the quarter, there's this cute little blonde girl kind of in a bathrobe, like a patient. And she's like, honey, what are you, what are you doing? And the girl giggles and runs away. The nurse runs after her, goes and then gets the vampire. Yes. That, that was Alicia. <laughs> no, See, it, it's very interesting because you did you did try to bridge the the gap and very smartly between the old Midnight Society and the new Midnight Society. You did this very good episode um, called Tale of the Silver Sight, which was it had the new Midnight Society cast. But Gary gets brought back into it, and Gary kind of like it, it's interesting because it was the first episode to do this. Like the new Are You Afraid of the Dark, the stories are ent- entwined with the storytellers. That wasn't the case. The storytellers told the stories, and the story was the story. They're two totally different things. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Alex. Um, because we have some <laughs> questions from some people. Thank I, I would have kept going for that's a, that's a um, cue. I've got twenty minutes left, mate. Make the yes, show. Yes. Okay. So, um, so really quick, <laughs> they 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 bridge the gap by Gary living out like the story that's being told in front of you with. With the new Midnight Society, it was a really good bridge, and it should have played out better. Um, God, man, I got so many more things to say to you, DJ. This isn't crazy, um, but we have some, we have some questions, man. I have some questions. I'm a part of, like, I'm a '90s kid, so I join every group that means anything to me, and I'm a part of this. Are you afraid of the dark um, fan group? Of course. Um, and I the asked Facebook them. One? Yes, the Facebook, Facebook one. I, I'm yes. on that too. Well, there we go. There you go. So you, know, so you might have seen my question. Is there a question from you in here? <laughs> Ask DJ to remember what's his face's name. Um, okay, so um, I, got, I said, hey, Midnight Society, we're having DJ Hale on our podcast. Any questions for legends? People will submit, oh, cool. will, of course, get a shout out. 
Um, this is from Matthew Dawkins, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce, pronounce your name right. Did the Twilight Zone influence you? It seems like science, aliens, ghosts, magical items, and mysticism are building blocks for a good creepy series. I, absolutely. Um, it, it, as much as when people talk about Are You Afraid of the Dark Now, so much of the conversation is wrapped around what was the scariest episode? What was the scariest villain? What, what did you freak out? Our goal wasn't necessarily to be as scary as possible. Because if we wanted to be as scary as possible, it would have been a lot scarier. Go rub zombie on him. <laughs> Every episode would have been like the night shift. Yeah, but it yeah. was so. So the I know, okay, yeah. there you go. So so it's, when you think about the Twilight Zone, wasn't that scary? It was just ironic and eerie and weird, and there were all different types of. So my goal really was to tell a different range of types of stories, like the Twilight Zone, and and I think you probably know this is kind of common knowledge that every episode has an homage to the Twilight Zone. Every and single episode. Sorry to interrupt, because, but Kenny uh, said the uh, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society is that an Easter egg for the Twilight Zone? Absolutely, because so many episodes of The Twilight Zone, Rod Serling, who is the creator host of the, of the show, would always come out at the beginning, and there, and he, what he would often say, you know, he looks right to the camera, and he would often say, submitted for your approval. A man goes into the store, and he, that was like his catchphrase. He didn't do it all the time, but that was his catchphrase, submitted for your approval. So I had the Midnight Society say, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Side. That is direct homage. So to cool, Zone. so cool. Yeah. Okay, um, really quickly now, because I said that so really, so fast. Oh, God damn it, I'm sorry, DJ. So you did a movie, for, you, you crossed the streams. You went over and did something with Disney, who was the big competitor for Nickelodeon at the time. There was Nickelodeon and, and Disney Channel for the, mm-hmm. for the kids' hearts. Uh, you did a movie that in, I loved so much as a kid. I rode the ride a thousand times. It was the, the Tower of Terror, a brilliant movie, which gave a story, a backstory to this ride that they have down there. It's very interesting that you had a little bit of influence from rod sterling because the you know tower of terror is a twilight zone inspired ride and it's very full circle that this whole thing kind of happened well it's it sort of is twilight zone experience sort of sort of, uh, sort of there, there you know. the, it, it, it was much more uh, mercenary than that because you know in, in doing research for that ride and all that kind of stuff i found out the history of how that ride was made and that ride is was at is and was at the uh, Disney Hollywood Studios down there. So the theme of the Hollywood Studios is Hollywood and movie making. And whatnot. So they came up with the idea for this haunted hotel. They wanted to come up with some way to somehow justify that it was on a movie themed thing. Yeah. So that's why they put the Twilight. They kind of layered in the Twilight Zone to justify it being a TV show. Um, mm. When I made the movie. Um, Thank God, actually, they said to me, you cannot mention the Twilight Zone at all, which was fine by me. <laughs> because, and the reason being is that um, it was for ABC, which was a wonderful world of Disney. Twilight Zone was a CBS show. And between CBS and, I guess, the Rod Serling estate, it would have been a big deal to have to license that name, Twilight Zone, to put it on ABC. So they just said, better just to ignore it completely, which was fine by me. I didn't, I didn't want to make an episode of the Twilight Zone. Yeah. So that's why it was just Tower of Terror rather than Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. I, I love that movie so much. I'm not going to lie, man. Like, I, once again, I wish we had all the time in the world for this, but we don't. Um, okay, so this is a good one by Chris Armstrong. Who would win in a cage match, you or R.L. Stein? I know what my choice is. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it good question. Depends on what the uh, depends on what the uh, the uh, the the weapons were. <laughs> if it was coming up with a million scary stories, he'd probably kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Mediocre scary stories. Um, uh, by the way, I th- everyone should know that Are You Afraid of the Dark does predate um, the Goosebumps by a couple of years, in fact. So if anything, I think Arl Stein owes you a couple shekels. Well, well, yes and no. I mean, it, the TV show definitely does. Uh, yes. And even going back to what I said before, uh, Goosebumps was on Fox. It was on a broadcast network. So the world mm-hmm. of who could see Goosebumps was way big. Plus, once that Goosebumps TV series started, it was already based off of an existing franchise that was hugely popular, those Goosebumps books that, that still remain popular to this day. So, so they, they had a leg up on us. But, but in terms of TV, scary, yeah, we were we predated by a couple of years. Oh, yeah. There, because because some... of Goosebumps, to this day, I don't kill spiders. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is from Jeremy B- um, Bailey, B A Y L O I. I'm very sorry. What is what is your favorite episode? What was your favorite episode to film, and what was your least favorite episode to film? Ooh. Uh, 
fa- favorite episode to film in general, my favorite episode. And I don't say this because it's the best episode. I maybe it is. I don't know. It's all subjective. Um, was the show we did in the beginning of the second season called the tale of the midnight madness. Yes. Um, it, it was, that's my favorite episode. And it's because oh, it's and so it, it goes beyond what the episode is. It, mm. It's because when you're making a show, it was the beginning of the second season. Everything was felt right. And we, we, we knew we were a success. We, we, I, we, we knew where all the bathrooms were, you know, everyone was working and was the first show we did that I thought this is what we can pull off. And I, and I think, so that's my favorite. It's more of a sentimental favorite as much as the episode itself. It's so well done. And it's, uh, it's my really least scary. Mm, it was so scary. It was good. Yeah, it was, it's a good, and it Dr. Vink in it, of course. Yes, exactly. Um, Dr. Voo, voo, voo. <laughs> um, my least favorite episode, no question. Same season. Uh, the tale of the pinball wizard. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I, yes. I directed that episode. It was there was a case of we bit off way more than we could chew. It was too big of an episode. It was the only episode that ended up taking six days to shoot. Um, it was a torturous, torturous shoot. Um, I, I still I, I, there was a mall near where I live in Santa Monica um, that it turns out was designed by the same people who designed that mall in Montreal. And I didn't realize that until the season was over and fine, I'm going home. And I went to this mall and it was like, it looked the same. And I was just like, ah, like my skin started to crawl. I'm like, God, I'm back in the mall again. This is horrible. So yeah, that was probably my least favorite the film. Um, okay. One last thing um, from this, from these guys, uh, da, 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 where did it just go? Um, when did you realize um, the lasting impact on pop culture that you were having? And this was uh, by Matthew Sam. You know, you actually kind of asked that before. I not until fairly recently. Um, again, at the time, you make a show and you get keep getting renewed and everything's fine, everybody's working and you get good feedback, but that's it and it's over. It wasn't until maybe the last ten years, maybe um, that with social media and whatnot, you start yeah, hearing say, the social media. From people. Mm. Um, I, I did have one experience a while ago. Um, it, it was going way back to when we were shooting the first season, uh, I was sitting in the, the, one of the, the prop department with one of the producers of the show, Bill Bonecutter. And we're looking at this seven foot tall clown dummy called Zebo. Mm. And we're looking at this thing. We hadn't even shot the episode yet. We're looking at this thing. And Bill said, do you ever get the feeling that 20 years from now, somebody's going to come up to you and say, Excuse me, you DJ Mikhail? And you'll say, Yeah. And they'll say, Well, I'm Zebo the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> you, you twisted me, right? And I go, so so we laughed, haha, fun. Several years ago, I was I'm an author too, and I was on a book tour. And I was in, in the Midwest someplace, and we're at a restaurant, and this waiter comes up to us and very happy guy he says, Hi, I'm Bill, I'll be your waiter. Hi, Bill. And like, what are you doing in town? He's like, well, we're here for a book thing. Goes, oh, really? What books did you write? And, and I didn't think you'd know my books. So you write anything I ever would have heard of? And I said, well, yeah, given your age, I, you, you might. I did a TV show called Are You Afraid of the Dark? And he just said, oh, Zebo the Clown. <laughs> That's when you <laughs> push people in front of you. Oh you like, God, him. <laughs> I start reaching for the knife on the table. Like, oh my God. <laughs> that was probably one of the first moments of, wow, this has been long lasting. So that's pretty cool. God. And this that's something we didn't even get to touch on. The fact that you're a fantastic author and you're and you're continuing to entertain children to you know today yeah. with your amazing stories. Um I would I, I gotta thank you so much, DJ. I, this I, has I'm been I'm gonna show you something you, you Oh like. please, please do. I, <laughs> we're we're trying to be considerate for your time, not the other this way around, be, man. Uh, this is in the category of uh, this is this is kind of the thing that started it all. Mm. Um that's the the twisted claw. Oh, that's wow. awesome. and, and, and not to kind of dispel any notion, but it's, it's a, it's a Turkey claw. <laughs> yeah, that, you, I mean, works. It's, made, it's, it's, it's resin, but, but it was modeled after a turkey. but that's the original prop from, uh, the, from the pilot episode of the thing they gave the three wishes. That is that amazing. Thing. Well, prop to keep so, just to scan right. it. The grand probably kids. the best prop to keep from, from all of it, even though it's kind of God. broke a little bit, but I, I forgot. Um, Kenny, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask any questions if you were, if you've got anything you wanted to ask. Um, I just had one thing. Uh, 
So I, I'm the one in the group that really didn't know too much about this. So I went and binge watched all of them. <laughs> Great show. Stopping for meals, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one thing I've always curious about is almost every character has an explanation as to where they went. What happened to Eric? Is is there a behind the scenes <laughs> thing? <laughs> Deep cuts pulled from Kenny. I love you. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> the answer is I don't know. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> what happened? This is in the category. If I knew then what I knew now, I would have addressed it. Mm. Um, we did the first season, and we got picked up for a second season. And so it's like, okay, are we going to change anything for the second season? And uh, it, it just felt like there's too many kids around the campfire. Yep. Um, I mean, there are 147 kids and it's like, you know, <laughs> just, yeah, to give everyone a story, it just seemed like it was too cumbersome. It was right. And, and uh, I'm forgetting the name of Jason. I think it was his name. Um, he, he wasn't that thrilled with being on the show for lack of a better term, um, he, want, and so it just seemed like, okay, maybe this isn't a good thing. So, so we're just like, okay, no more. Yeah. Go and work in McDonald's then. Go on. Up yeah, here. Right. <laughs> I'm sure he's gone on to a great career since yeah, and he yeah. made the right choice and all that kind of stuff. But, but it just, the combination of too many kids and there's some reluctance on his part to come back. It's just like, okay, so we'll, we'll part friends. Um, and I don't think I addressed it at all. You you did. You did, though. It, it was addressed in the sense that it's real. And this is something I should really give you props for was it wasn't that you gave a full fledged explanation. You said, well, their family moved away. And that's the true story of all of our friends in school. You know, you grow up and sometimes that's what happens. Your friends move away and there's no party. There's no lasting thing. They just are gone one day. You know, usually you get told. But other than that, I mean, it's it's Wait, it's, did I say that about Eric or I know no, I really did that with. With no, I mean, David maybe on uh, Kristen, but I'm not so sure. Yeah. I did it. No, you did it for other kids, but literally Eric was there and then never mentioned again. Yeah, I don't think I did it with Eric. <laughs> because really? okay, Eric, so that's I, why. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, as well, I said, Eric died, you know. Well, <laughs> Eric, well we, mur- we buried Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd the bone dust come from? <laughs> yeah, right. Eric. You know what's in his bag? It's Eric. <laughs> um, so as I said, if I knew then what I knew now, which is the people were going to care, I just think anyone would care. Well, I, you're I, the you're the creator, so why don't you tell us something right now? What happened to Eric, DJ? <laughs> I think I just did. There you go. He died. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love of death. So, <laughs> you moved away. He, um, he, I, I do yeah, have to away. ask as well because nostalgia is bringing things up all the time. You know, um, it's becoming a real big thing now for for guys like us that are in our thirties. They just want to go back and live there for a week. You know. Uh, Comic cons are huge. Obviously, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, have you been going to any Comic cons? Have you been to any, any of them? Yeah, mostly for um, uh, for my books. Mm. Um, in fact, I just did a panel because Comic Con would have been last weekend. The San Diego Comic Con would have mm. been last weekend. So, but it didn't happen. So they had a bunch of um, uh, remote podcasts that were done, kind of like this. So I I did one of those um, with a bunch of other authors. Um, the, the closest thing I did for Are You Afraid of the Dark was actually really fun. Um, there's a thing that was just got canceled again this year called uh, Midsummer Scream, which is down in Long Beach. And it's a horror convention. It's a horror con, if you will. Um, and, and it's really wonderful. I think it's interesting. Science fiction fans are very serious about their fandom. They're, they like take this stuff really seriously. And, and horror fans always do it with a wink and a nod. It's like they're not far away from a laugh with, you know, you have some terrible zombie grab, but there's always a, kind of a, a wink and a laugh mind. So I was asked if I would do a panel for Are You Afraid of the Dark? And um, so I got a, another, I got Ron Oliver, a guy who wrote direct a lot of the episodes and, and my friend Scott Marcus was the moderator. And uh, so we said, okay, we'll do this thing. So, uh, it, so we went down, it was like a comic con, but it was a horror con. And uh, then they brought us over to this auditorium where we we're going to do the panel. And, it was huge. I mean, this thing was like, it was this monstrous thing. And I'm like, oh my God, no one's going to show up. This is, this is not, this is going to be bad. This is going to be embarrassing. There's going to be three people. Come on down to the front so we can talk, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Because it was kind of off site. And I'm like, okay, fine. So we're down the green room for a while and I hadn't seen Ron in a long time. We got together. 
and the Nickelodeon had sent us a, a, like a teaser setup um, video, which was a really fast paced uh, compilation of the show, uh, which we showed beforehand. And so it was this is such a great memory that Ron and I were standing in the wings waiting to be introduced to come out. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, there's nobody here. This is going to be it's, it's going to be this is going to be horrible. And the lights went out. And again, we're not seeing anything. We're just looking. We're in the wings looking at the screen. The lights went out. And on the screen came the opening title sequence to Are You Afraid of the Dark? And the place exploded. Wow. It was jammed. It was standing room only. And Ron and I just looked at each other like, whoa, <laughs> what is this? And it was awesome. It, it, it was such a fun, it was having a conversation like this in front of a couple thousand people who were in the same boat that you, you, know, the, the, you are, Tom, anyway. <laughs> they, they remembered every episode. And so that was, so yeah, so I have done the... the I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got that reception. I really am because uh, we're friends. I mean, I, I don't talk about... Uh, you know, previous guest but we're friends with charlie adlard who's one of the co-creators of the walking dead and writers and and artists of of many um uh, uh, you know cult, culture items um are the unsung heroes and you know charlie adlard can walk around a comic con and not be recognized whereas the cast from the tv show will be like they'd, they'd be swamped by people uh, so i'm glad you got that reception well it's true and people people and with every reason that people think that actors make tv shows and of course, they're a very big part of the TV show, but they are the face of the TV show. They don't realize there are writers and directors and people slaving behind the scenes. And um, it, it was a little different for me. You asked me before when I started to recognize you know, the cultural significance and whatnot, is that where that doesn't apply is with being an author. Because with authors, it's all about your name. So because I've written a lot of books and best-selling books, suddenly my name is more out there than it normally would be as a TV guy. So the kind of funny thing happened, people started putting two to, two together. They're like, DJ McHale, oh yeah, I read that. Wait a minute, I know that name from someplace else. And suddenly they're putting the two and two together. It's like, oh my God, that's the guy that made Are You Afraid of the Dark? So so I, I've got a little bit more recognition than probably most people do because of my books. Mm, well uh, earned though, well earned recognition. I mean, your well, stuff is- And, and everyone deserves that kind of recognition because people work hard, right? I mean, I, mean, I, I pe people who wrote Are You Afraid of the Dark for me, no, they don't get the recognition. People are talking about, oh, the ghastly grinner was so great, but Ron wrote that. <laughs> you know, he came up with the idea and they just don't get the, the and, and, you know, it, it makes sense, but but I wish writers would, would get more. I mean, there are some superstar writers that do get plenty of accolades, but there are a lot of people behind the scenes that don't, and, and they deserve it. Um, so, one, we got to thank you for the, the time. You're so generous with it. Thank you so much, DJ. You, you are a terrific guest, and I'm so grateful that you, you worked out some time for us today. Um, I'd love to have you back on to talk about your writing at some point. Um, next time that you have a book coming out, we'd love to have you on so we can talk about that whole portion because you're not just a one-trick pony, sir. You have many a tricks under, your, under there. <laughs> I like when they, I, they, I've, I'm referred to as kid, kid entertainment vet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Very well put. Holy mackerel. It's a, it's a natural trait, though. When we had Mark Summers on, I said to him, like, you know, you're very easy to talk to. It must be just like a natural thing you, you never forget. It's just uh, amazing. You know, oh, well, he's up. also, he, boy, he's a good, he's, I mean, he's a legend at Nickelodeon. And I was yeah. watching, and maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I, I like a lot of reality TV and whatnot. I was watching an episode <laughs> of, of Restaurant Impossible. Yep. Mark Summers is one of the producers of that show because he was actually on it. I'm like, oh my God, that's Mark Summers from Nickelodeon. That's really cool. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of writers and, and, and artists, the people behind the scenes, uh, people are not recognized. But DJ McHale, you have, you have you've sculpted this gentleman to my, to my left here. Um, and you have, you have made his life what it is today. And he absolutely adores the product that you made. So I am absolutely... 100% grateful that you've come on. I'm a little bit jealous. You know, it's time to get one of my heroes on. Come on, we've got to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> That's two you've had now, Bruno. Uh, but thank you so much. On behalf of the USUC team, the listeners, thank you so much. Everybody, DJ McHale. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was my pleasure thanks guys we'd love to get you on again because we didn't get we didn't get for half the questions that we wrote down for you but no, we'd love no, to invite no. you on again. Yeah. Well, 
Careful what you wish for. Ah, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Thank My you so goodness. much for joining us. What we'll do now is uh, we'll finish off for the last half an hour. We'll let you go get on with your day. But thank you so, so okay, much cool. for joining us. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Jay. I think there we go. Okay, man, that was cool too. He even had like the like the look off and everything. That was brilliant. I earned this, so I'm gonna spark this joint now. Absolutely, Holy well fuck. done. I am so sorry to put you under pressure there, but we, I think Kenny will agree. We, you could have sat there for four hours and just like, can you just say my name one more time, please? <laughs> <laughs> can you say? Can you please say? And Tom's gonna tell this story now. Like, oh, I'm gonna tell the story. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, uh, DJ McHale. And I was a bit nervous about what, what what name to call him because obviously uh, his name is what is it uh, you know he's not DJ McHale he's got a name and I was just like what do I call him do I call him Sir McHale Mister yeah oh, DJ definitely friend. call him Sir McHale that's the way to go give him a knighthood <laughs> fucking well and by the way for for uh, Kenny you can unmute for one second please um, for the fact that you guys were not as familiar with the show with me you guys did tremendous you you brought the thunder fucking Kenny Alex thank you so much for for you know helping me along with trying to do the shit that I want to fucking do because you didn't you guys don't have to you don't have to pay attention to this type of stuff but you guys do so thank you so much for that uh, not a problem at all no, I, I love um i love what we do as, as, a, as a show and as a network uh and you know we talk about culture american culture that was very much your culture that was you growing up i think i said something similar with mark summers you know it sculpted you as a person and it's very been very intriguing to find out all about it and we had similar things in the uk i didn't have are you afraid of the dark wasn't massive for me i do remember it existing we had tales from the crypt which had, uh, always start off with that, um, the um, the crypt keeper and the, the crypt keeper. Yeah, the crypt keep, cre- yeah. crypt keeper. But it was always stop, stop, start uh, uh, animation. You know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, wasn't it like a trailing cam shot? Like dun 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 yeah, dun, yeah. dun 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 dun. We had like things like trapdoor. Did anybody, anybody know mm. trapdoor? What trapdoor was? It was like this thing that was set in the basement of a of a castle. <laughs> And there was, there was a literal trapdoor, and underneath the trapdoor was all the, the monsters and stuff. It was, it was just a weird, weird show, but we had all stuff like that. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. But yeah, that was fantastic. But, you know, apart from that, what have you been up to with your week, Bruno? You've been uh, busy? I've been, I've been doing a couple things. Not, not crazy amounts. Um, I played a little bit of golf today, which um, I was really happy to do. So I, I've come to realize, Alex, that it's not even the game so much. Like, the game's fun. But the getting out, the exercise, the the camaraderie that goes along with it, and if you pay attention, you might just happen to get pretty good at sports. So I did, I did a lot of that today to kind of like you know just get some stress out of me. Um, but I also watched a movie this week. I fucking um, I, yeah. I watched a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and something that you kind of razzled me about a little bit, which is really really funny. I love that you posted about it. Um, I watched Hamilton. Yeah. I am going to watch this film. I am going to watch this film. I went to today, but there's too much noise about. I think it's, got, it's two hours, 40 minutes. It's a big commitment. It's a long movie. So it's I longer need... than that. I think it's like um, I think it's like three and a half, almost four hours. Too. It's it, fucking long. It's like two hours, 40 minutes. Is. I, should check. I checked earlier, so it's nearly four, three hours. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Well, the one on Disney Plus, right? Yeah, yeah the one on Disney Plus. I mean, I... I mean, it probably is. It probably just seemed that long because I'm so used to a format of television where you know, it's all like, like it's not, "Hey, it's America!" Ooh, it's just like it was. It was very. Well, see, the thing is, I kind of ran into that point as well because it got to the Revolutionary War part and it ended. I was like, "Oh, the movie's over," and then it's like, "Nope, you still have an hour left." And I'm like, "What the fuck do they have to say about this dude after the revolution?" A lot, a lot, Alex, and it's it's very well done. The things that I think you, that would intrigue you is it's hip hop. It's not like yeah. you're. It's not like a Vita. It's not like um, you know, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. It's hip hop. It, it's got, and it's not poorly done hip hop. But you could imagine that, you know, a, a musical that is in hip hop would be really kind of like bland and really like just doesn't have that feel that grungy good hip hop does. This I don't this know, thing man. Encapsulates everything about it. That opening song didn't grab me. I was kind of like, what the fuck? What is this? This is bad. Uh, the, 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 but I guess I, I don't just base it on the first song. I don't, I'll give it a chance. But that first song I was kind of like, didn't grab me. Whereas like the greatest show was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, yeah, you know, whereas this one was kind of like, 
do, do you well it gets it gets far better and uh, the thing that i love the most which i don't think it'll bother you because you're not really you you know you love your country and you love where you live and stuff but you don't take that stuff too seriously especially the royals mm-hmm. the the king of england has this amazing couple of parts he's only in like two or three parts but they're so fucking well done that i went back and rewatched his bits because it's essentially like he comes out and he's kind of like looking around all crazy and we know that uh it was what king george the second mad king george third. was it yeah mad. it was mad king george exactly yeah. he has like a little bit of spittle coming down off his lip that's so <laughs> subtle like you can tell he's doing it but like he's not doing it overly to the point where like oh come on man it's, it's a little much it looks like he's not doing it on purpose um and the, <laughs> and the songs are about how much he loves america he loves us so much that he'll fucking kill us to let us know how much he loves us it was brilliant <laughs> dude it was so good and the second song was after the revolutionary war it's all about like well fuck you you're gonna miss me when i'm, when I'm gone and shit like that it was so fucking it's, good it's good that they do like comic like even with like R- Roman and juliet what's the guy's name is it perkio or something like that? the guy that's like the comic yeah, relief yeah. Uh, i love yeah. things like that and if i, I was ever gonna be related to a royal it'd be definitely my king judge what execute him <laughs> he sneaked <laughs> execute him it was, with his head. <laughs> it was fucking excellent dude and, and it kept me really interested dude. and like not only that like it, it kind of pushes some barriers because you know it's Disney plus so it's very family friendly they swear a bunch of it like way more than i thought they were going to they drop an f-bomb that's the only thing they edit out of there they don't say the f-bomb that they say oh get a grip they, disney jesus well, christ I mean, Yes, I would like to see it, but I mean, I'm really impressed. It, I brought up some questions because they can't, like, this is a very expensive show. Like, if I want to go see the off-Broadway version of Hamilton right now, which is not even the first one, the, the one that's worth all the money, it still cost me, like, you know, 80 to $100 a ticket. Yeah. Now, when they filmed this, because they filmed it, and I'm sure it was only, like, one, maybe two nights at the most, I wonder if they lowered price uh, ticket prices for those people, because you got to imagine the cameras got in the way of the show at some point. Hmm. Yeah, because I heard something about like Hamilton being like a real like elitist show because it was very expensive to get tickets for. That's what I heard. Well, I, I, is it, I isn't want... it all Broadway elitist then? I mean, because like when I went, okay, maybe it's because it, okay, but Hamilton did not have any celebrities per se, and there was like one or two famous people I didn't recognize. That um, Eric Fluger, the great Eric Fluger, was like, oh, this is who played King George, and this is who played that. And I'm like, oh, you're way smarter than I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, as well, always. Is Eric yeah, yeah, exactly. Is Eric Fluger fucks in the 20s, probably. So, um, I don't remember, see, I smoked that joint. My fucking podcast and rain just went that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but even so, I, I was on, in New York City and Will Ferrell was you're doing Your Welcome America, which is the uh, the, Briti- the, uh, the British, the uh, George W. Bush commentary yeah. comedy piece that he did. And those tickets were only like 50, 75 bucks a piece. And Hamilton's more than that. So Broadway's always been a rich person's game, but I feel like you're right. I feel like there was really something, maybe like who, hey, Kenny, who wrote Hamilton? Like, was it a big name? Was there, did they have to pay off somebody? <laughs> to, uh, well, Kenny searches that. My wife goes, I thought it was about the racing driver. <laughs> and I was like, you fucking they made amazing. a musical out of Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> was he, is he like a Indy car driver? What's uh, up, for, Formula One. So the Lynn Manuel Miranda, uh, who was born in 1980 in New York, wrote Hamilton, mm, the musical did they, version. Did they do any bigger plays than that, or was that their first one? Well, give me a second here. <laughs> Can you imagine that if if that was like the first one out of the bag? Like you. So were he so- he contributed to the soundtrack for Moana. Uh, earned an Academy Award nomination for How Far I'll Go. Uh, he did the musical Mary Poppins Returns, um, and he assumed the mantle of a lamplighter um, and sidekick to the nanny. Uh, he was in His Dark Materials, which is a TV show, an amazing oh, one, yeah. by the way. Course, yeah, yeah. Um, and he won the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Wow, very talented guy then. That's where that elitist thing comes from. They're like, whoa, you want to see the guy that wrote... Uh, Moana. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a good collection of um, Dude, it's good CV. I mean, it's good. No wonder. Fuck. I mean, like, but once again, the, the cat, it, it was just really well done. I, I'm not going to lie. If I had 200 bucks right now, if they were doing, but the same people though, because those people really kind of like, you know, they, they really touched me in a naughty place. Um, if I could go see those people, I would definitely pay a hundred dollars ticket. Like, and I don't even know. 
I think I, I didn't watch it with the wife. I watched it by myself. Probably the gayest thing. I could have watched it with my wife and like had some credibility. But like, no, I was watching it with a female. I'm totally okay. But it was good, dude. You know me. I, I love American history and I love hip hop. And it was a good combination of that and comedy. So uh, doing some further research on him, here's some polls that you guys might uh, be more familiar with. Star Wars, The Force Awakens, he wrote the song for the scene in Maz Cantana's can- Cantina, which oh. was an homage to the classic Mos Eisley Cantina song. Um, he wrote the song for the new DuckTales that just came out in 2017. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and he was also in The Rise of Skywalker. Um he wrote a song for the scene on the desert planet Pasana, in addition to making a cameo appearance as a resistance trooper. Oh. Other than that, it's pretty much straight across the board Broadway stuff. Oh, shit. Mm, nice. It's good. I will give it a chance, but I can't have kids asking me to do things on the tablets and asking me for things and running around. And, you know, I need to, I need to have one of those quiet moments to watch that film, I think. Um, but yeah, I, the options you gave me were Hamilton or, the Umbrella Academy season two, and obviously I was gone. I've been waiting. For, I swear to God, I've been counting down the minutes, the minutes for this show to come back. So I was just kind of like, nah, man. Even when I get off this, I'm gonna get a tub of ice cream, um, um, and then I'm gonna watch it, uh, Umbrella Umbrella Academy, and hopefully get some head. I'm joking. No, nah. <laughs> no I've been looking forward to it. And that first, the Shane Chebs who wrote that, he wasn't too keen on the first episode. I've got to say, I was like, oh, oh. Oh, all the way through that first episode, it was, was fucking phenomenal. I was just like, wow, because, oh, yeah. Was that when has started giving you head or was that due to the <laughs> show? <laughs> that was, that's when, uh, no, she, she, I, uh, do you know what? It was better than any head anyone could give me. I'm Ooh. telling you, it was fucking amazing. I fucking hope Kaz hears this. I'm sure oh, she's right behind oh, you saying it because she, you're that she, candid. She, this is one of those things that I would say that she'd be like, yeah, he's probably right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know how this fucker's mind works. Like, you know, give him fucking Jason Todd and that's it. He's gone. Like, you know, the, the, the things that I really enjoy, I really fucking enjoy. Uh, and i got to say, right, um, it's, it's, it is a bit of a spoiler. Um, but if you watch the Umbrella Academy, you'll kind of get what I'm talking about, right? I'm not going to go full into it. Kenny, have you watched the Umbrella Academy? Just a year, a year or no before I go into this? We are five or six episodes into the first season. We're not quite to the finale yet. And if you spoil anything, I swear to God, we're not friends anymore. Okay, I won't say what I was going to say then. Who's your favorite character, Kenny, so far? 100%, hands down, the druggy drag queen. Klaus. 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 Klaus is my hero. I want to be like him when I start drugs. (laughs) (laughs) He has got one of the most amazing, most touching, most beautiful backstories. I love him so much. Tom, you need to watch this. I nearly cried Whoa. when I found out why Klaus is the way he is. Yeah. I mean, my favorite episode, I mean, my favorite character so far is definitely Hamilton. Fucking, he just killed it with his fucking rap and his fucking singing. And, you know uh, what I say? I like Rick Sanchez and Darth Vader. And I like John McClane too. Who you got on your team, bitch? Like, <laughs> Fucking Hamilton, <laughs> <laughs> Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Um, it was it was really good. Um, fucking, I don't know. I'll watch it eventually. I'll get to Umbrella Academy Academy eventually. It was written by Jared Way, man. I, I get it, man. I get it. Like, I, the, the, but that's not like the part that like dra- I'm not like, oh, Jared Ray wrote Ray wrote this. I have to get on top of it. That, I mean, that's, gets, that's but it's still a fucking amazing, right? Even well, as a musician, it's, it's not even about that. I've nothing bad to say about. It. I love uh, my Chemical Romance the CD, the Black Parade. I thought that was an excellent album all the way through and through. And I was a real piece of shit back in the day. I didn't. I judged music based off of nothing. And the fact my little sister listened to my Chemical Romance, I was like, that's stupid. You're stupid. But as an adult, I listen to things and I actually. To put a real, you know, judge's ear to the whole thing, and I love that fucking album. It's it's really well done. Well, you know what? I heard a rumor that you went and watched the Umbrella Academy tonight. You heard a rumor that I was going to go watch the Umbrella. Yeah, that rumor, those lies. I'll be watching X Files tonight. <laughs> Alex, and, yeah, 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 I don't get it. Yeah. What I've learned in therapy is if someone is not ready to be happy, we can't force them to be happy. No, no, we yeah. can just support them until they find that part of their heart. So, Tom live in darkness when you are ready for the light my friend <laughs> we will show it to you <laughs> like that's, that's a euphemism 
Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry for not getting your joke. I saw your fucking hand going above your head. Apparently, no, you very, won't get the funny. joke until you watch the no. show. You won't get no, it. No. The oh, that's know, cool. Like, let's make let's let's make inside jokes for Tom things that Tom can't. Play. People that watch the show will be like, ah, see what he did there. See what he did. Uh, so funny. Let's I, I, I got a soft spot for the show because I, I met I met cast the, the cast of the show. I got to yeah, meet and yeah, shake yeah. the hands and be like, yo, I like What's you, up, bro. Uh, yeah. Tom Tom Hopper, the guy, is his name Tom Hopper? What's his name? Oh, shit. The guy plays number one. Um, he's been in more franchises than anybody in modern day TV. He's been yeah. on Merlin. He's been on Black Sails. He's been in Game of Thrones. He's been on, like, he's been on everything. There's somebody out there that's just gone, we really like this guy. Um, uh, so he's been on everything. It's really cool. Jesus Christ. Fucking, oh, that's, a, that's a career that has legs. Um, that's, you know... I don't yeah, know. I'll get to it eventually. I've I've been watching fucking. I've been playing video games a little bit lately, just a tiny bit. I've been playing like some Far Cry Five. I got the Alien Isolation game, which I'm gonna get into next. Oh, have you never played that game before? No, but oh. it's like if if anyone knows anything, I'm really weird about games nowadays. Like I really enjoy the Friday Thirteenth game, and it's all big game of hide and seek. And from what I understand, fucking Alien Isolation is a big game of hide and seek with some really horrible consequences. In the same way that Dark Souls is very unforgiving for mistakes in a game, I hear this one. Tomb Raider too. The new Tomb Raider. She dies in horrific ways. If you get it wrong, she's fucked. Uh, But yeah, you need to definitely, I want to see proof as well of you with the lights off. Uh, get Shona around as well. I'm, she'll enjoy what, it's like a horror movie, genuinely. I knew people that had to stop playing that game because it was too scary i know that because i'm one of them <laughs> okay so we gotta figure out how i can record myself playing this because i mean like, like don't be like yo selfie look i'm in the dark There's an hey, alien. yeah but then i have like, my pants locker. down that's how i roll at night when I watch Kenny, movies and shit. have you have you played this game before alien isolation it's, it's like consoles it's crap no it's on pc oh! but it's crap no it's got a lot of bugs the ai is i mean it's akin to a I'll use polite language. It's just not a smart three-year-old. <laughs> I was going to have some banter with you then about that back in two. I was going to say, uh, we'll, we'll schedule you more the androids or the aliens, but fuck in, it. Instead, instead Kenny was like, fuck you. <laughs> you yeah. It sucks ass and you're a pussy Angry for birds were scarier. Like, <laughs> <laughs> My kid spent 50 bucks on that one day. Terrified me. Fuck you, Alex. <laughs> oh, Did you ever God. play the old school game Fear? Like yes. F period, E period. That one was scary. My brother loves that game. I played a little bit of it and I was like, this game shit, put it away. I, but the, I, I, that was a period in my life when you know when you have like six games to play at the same time yeah. and you just go to the most easily appealing one. I think that's the that's what happened with that game. Yeah. No fucking good. Um, oh, something else I've been doing this week. Uh, remember how uh, on the live we were talking um, about uh, about me wanting to do more? I'm, I'm off of keto. I've been off of keto for like four, three days, something like that. And, um, I've integrated, uh, weightlifting. I, I decided that like, I need to do something with the carbs that I intake. I've been enjoying food a little bit more. Like I actually had lunch day instead of doing my intermediate fasting because when, once you have carbs, you get hungry again. Like, so I get hungry midday, but instead of like, n- you know, just sitting around after eating like some noodles or something like that, I go and I work out. And I, I was telling Alex earlier, I don't, I'm not good at sitting there and just focusing on working out for like hours. I can't do that. I don't have that type of drive, but I do guilt myself into if, if I'm doing something else, if I'm going downstairs to go check on the chickens, if I'm checking on the kids, if I'm bringing laundry down, I guilt myself very, very easily into not into doing more reps. Like I'll do a set of 10 for each thing I do stop. And then I'll go do some other stuff, clean, take care of the kids, whatever the fuck ever. And then I'll be going back downstairs and I'll pass it again. and be like, Oh, another set of 10 and I'll do it again. And I'll probably do that like five, six, seven times a day. And I already feel a good difference in my arms. Like when I first started doing, I could barely do my 30 pounder five times a piece. If I was lucky, especially on my left arm, my left arm is shit. Um, it's attached to a bad nerve and stuff like that. Today, I can now do about 11 or 12 on each one, and it's not really a problem until about the 12th. So I'm already seeing a, a big amount of difference, and I'm glad that I'm, um, I'm, I'm glad that I have the drive to do something with my weight loss instead of just letting it be and being like, okay, well, you look good. You don't have to do anything else. I'm glad that I want to turn my body into a, a little bit healthier. I'm, I'm glad that, that that's what I really took from keto is that I don't want to be you know, the same size I was. Good, man. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. 
No, I'm I'm glad that you do, you you you're motivating yourself to do something physical. I can't at the moment. I don't know what it is. I mean, I'm going for I've had a bad week. You know, I've had a really bad week. It's been really stressful for me. Um, I've you know, it's been one of those weeks where it's not anybody's fault. There's no any problems. It's just like things have happened. You know, and you feel like there's a dark cloud following you every time everywhere you walk. You know, it's just one of those things that I can't shake because of circumstantial things. You know, mm. I'm sure next week will be better. Uh, I went to I went to a driving festival this morning, and it was a kids' party. You know, there's lots of music, dancing, there's water being squirted into the crowd and stuff like that. And I'm sat there sulking because I'm just like fuck the world, you know. And it's, that's, <laughs> that's because I'm not overworked. I'm not I'm not rushing around. I've done uh, two interviews this week. Uh, there's just been lots of little niggles following me around, you know. Uh, and I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, um, I'll be better next week. I, I think, honestly, I, dude, do you have any belief? I mean, I know you're a witch and all, but do you have any belief that the moon actually does affect our... Oh, I think uh, it's been proven that it does. I think that's where the term lunatic comes from, is when it's a full moon, there's more of a, something to do with the gravitational or mag, mag, magnetic field, or something to do with, uh, I mean, if uh, I don't know how to explain it. Like the 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 way that the uh, the moon aligns the magnetic pole from the Earth, like the same way the tides go in now and, and stuff like that. It, something it to do, yeah. Some, body. So, something to do with that. Some people can be susceptible to it, like you know. So when people when it's a full moon, sometimes people can feel a bit more hyperactive. It could be something to do with the the, the more light in the sky and they're kind of like, oh, <laughs> there's a fox, there's a hedgehog. So well, hold hold on, I gotta correct this. So lunatic um, actually comes from the Roman moon goddess Luna. And it was believed back then that the moon would affect the water in your brain, much like it affects sea levels. So basically causing high tide in your brain. And that's where they believed people who are acting crazy came from. So that's not a scientific term. It was actually from the Roman or the Greece and Roman times. But but does it though? I mean, like that's no. Maybe oh okay. Thank God because I'm like I'm like I'm totally believing this. I'm like oh my God, his like water's going to his right side of his head and he's going crazy. One day he's gonna snap and kill everyone. So there there is some things to be said that when people are going crazy, they might fixate on something. So someone might be more likely to fixate on the moon cycle as an example, Ooh. and thus cause trouble during that time but they're just as likely to fixate on something else like a Zenith or something of that sort. Maybe this is why you and me are partners. Maybe you're becoming a werewolf. Maybe, maybe. Dude, maybe. that'd um, be fucking dope. Yeah, it's been an interesting week. I was on the radio this week. Did you, did you know that? I no, there. I did not. Who, what, what fucking radio? Why w- wasn't I on there? What are you doing <laughs> without me? It was on WMNH in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. In New England, Manchester, England. No, England. in the in the US, in the US. Oh, yeah. what? In New you did a you you did a US show without me. What I, the did. Fuck? I did. Fuck You didn't even invite me. Be like, by the way, I have an American <laughs> co-host that could show up to your I studio and actually you. do this with you. You talk. You did talk about me. Did What'd you say? Nice you. things. I said this. I work with this dick. Um, no, I'm um, <laughs> <laughs> well done. I would have said it too. Um, no, what so, happened? What happened? Big shout out to Matt Connerton. Uh, he does a show called Matt Connerton Unleashed on a WM, WMNH, WM, uh, a radio station in Manchester, New Hampshire, in the US. And uh, I got watching his, I found his show by chance. It wasn't even on like a podcast group either. It was just like a sponsored ad. I was like, oh, I'll watch this. Really good. Political, political show. He's, he's very anti Trump, but it's quite funny because he speaks to people that are Trump and he gets like voice actors to do like Trump impressions and stuff. It's fucking brilliant, right? So I join in with a chat and stuff. I'm, hi, I'm from the UK. And it's like, whoa, we got a listener from the UK across the water. I think I was like the token English guy, you know? Yeah, uh, so yeah. I messaged him afterwards and I invited him on the show. I've, I've, I told you that he's coming on 29th. He's coming on our show. Um, he's oh. going to talk to us. Um, and uh, he invited me to call him via Skype this week. He's like, I want to get a British perspective on sort of our views on America and how they're, uh, America and how they're dealing with COVID-19. Um, and I was like, you know, I, rank up, I was very fair. I was kind of like, you know what? We were the laughing stock of the world with the whole Brexit thing. We were like, we're leaving soon. Maybe, maybe a bit later than what we thought. Like maybe, uh, you know, it was just a, a really embarrassing thing. So I know what it's like to be embarrassed about my country. And I think anybody that's ashamed of America right now has got a valid reason to be, you know. Uh, we are entering a, like a second phase of lockdown now. I've got a friend called Manola, right? She's opening um, uh, an eyelash extension uh, salon. Uh, we had her on the biscuit really excited i saw her in the parade um two days ago uh when i was moving my studio around and uh, she was like i'm opening on saturday i'm so excited i've been waiting for this so long she was beaming 
And then Boris came out and said, no, salons have got to wait two weeks. She didn't get to open. I was just like, for fuck's sake, but this is the price you pay. This is the price you pay when things spike. In America, things aren't doing that. They're not, they're, they're not, people aren't paying any consequences for what's going on. We did talk a bit about that. And we talked about USUC as well and kind of the, the culture thing, uh, how, how we have these conversations about stuff. It's, it was quite nice. It was really nice. So thanks to the guys there for inviting me on. It was good. Fucking, I mean, like, I don't know. We, me and, Ken, I mean, Kenny is far more knowledgeable the, about this whole scene than I'll ever be. But as far as like, you know, Vermont goes, luckily we're the only state that's, you know, like really going full bore with this whole thing. So we don't really have the same experiences that a lot, a lot of the other country does. So, but Kenny, do you have anything you want to throw in this? I know you do. As far as COVID goes, our about, president's about, a about fucking the idiot. <laughs> that could be something. So the the biggest thing I think that America suffers from more than anything else is tribalism. Um, yes. You can agree with a friend on 90%, but that 10% is enough to destroy friendships. Um, and I think COVID and the internet are aggravating that because you can go on the internet and you can find thousands of websites that support the opinion that COVID is a conspiracy. And then you can find three websites that show that it's scientifically proven to be a fact. And I think when you're trying to fight idiots that don't understand the value of researching both sides, which is the majority of Americans these days, um, they very end up in or very easily end up in that trap at believing, you know, in anti-vaxxing flat earth COVID theories, you know, Obama's a Muslim, that sort of stupidity that any intelligence you can figure out that it's not true. What well, what was that thing that Trump uh, got called out for earlier this week, Kenny? Where um, he was retweeting or agreeing with a doctor that said demons impregnate people. Oh yeah, semen demons. Semen demons. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 What, what, what was that? Uh, um, I, 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 all I heard about it. I didn't do any of my own research, but I mean, that's the thing with Trump is like he says this shit and. He does it in a way that it's like, is he speaking as a president? Is he trying to be funny? Is he trying to be serious? Like, and whenever you talk to his supporters, they always flip on the, oh, he was kidding. Oh, he didn't mean that. I Mad- don't know. Mad- Madonna came out and supported him with that as well recently. She said, oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, Madonna. I was like, well, who gives a fuck about Madonna these days? Did, I mean, still. Did she throw on her fake British accent when she was like, oi, I agree with the Trump. <laughs> so, okay, doing some more research on this because I wanted to be 100% correct. He retweeted a tweet by a so-called doctor. So this doctor, she described herself as a Texas-based physician but she actually graduated medical school in Nigeria. Um, nice. And she claimed she had successfully treated and cured 350 patients with hydroxychloroquine or whatever that oh, crap is that Trump's blowjob buddy is the owner of. Um, and yeah, it was basically a tweet saying that not only is it a cure, that you don't need masks. And there was a second part in that conversation where she mentioned male and female demons. Yeah. I, I, that was, yeah, it's a fucked up. No, thing. Yeah. It wasn't, it's not even a fucked up thing. That's a fucking badass thing. Like I wish that fucking there was demons that we could blame for shit. And do you know how easy it is to be like, Hey, by the way, I'm a great doctor. Ask all the patients I exercised. But it's, it's just, Blatant stupidity because you can't say COVID doesn't exist and then say demons made it. If it doesn't exist, then demons didn't make it. Thus, why are we having this argument? It's fucking insane. Like, the numbers speak for themselves. It's kind of like, yeah, I don't. Oh, she it. claimed ovarian cysts are caused by demon sex. Do it. I yeah, damn right. People. That's why I like to call my fucking activities is, is demon sex. <laughs> you fucking gonna lie down there and take it, bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking puke all over you. <laughs> Your mother's in here. I'm gonna fuck yeah, myself boy, you're going to hell. I mean, uh, well, I, sorry, wife. <laughs> oh, dude, good poll. Wow. South Park, the movie fucking poll? My man. Yeah. Little boy, you're going to hell. Oh, that's a good dude. I would. Can we high five really quick through the computer. Very nice. That was so good. I'm gonna hug. I'm gonna hug Kenny for real later. But while I'm hugging Kenny, I'm gonna whisper your name in his ear. So you know, it'll just be weird. It's Alex. <laughs> um, yeah, that was fantastic. Um, what you guys got planned this week? You got anything exciting? You got anything planned? 
Um, Kenny's coming over for food tomorrow at some point. We're going to eat together and share a meal. Other than that, I'm going to be working. I'm so jealous of your guys' like actual contact that you guys get to have, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah see, I'm weird. I have like a social anxiety thing. So I have to shower every time I go to Tom's just to make sure I'm clean. And my wife is now convinced I'm not going to see Tom. I'm going to see another woman. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Which is, I mean, technically, I'm, I, I have big enough titties. I'm technically a woman. So if she want to like, not you know, anymore, the, buddy, I won't hear any talk about your titties. I mean, they're flat. Well, eventually they're going to be fucking buff, son. I'm going to be fucking. Yeah. I mean, fucking just huge. Just stay away from fucking creatine, honestly, please. Like, I, I don't give what a fuck f- what you like. Are you are you being like serious right now? I'm just saying, like, I don't know what people get like when they're training. They're like, oh, dude, faster. that's a, well. Here, okay. First of all, thank you for being concerned. Second of all, I don't do drugs that don't do anything cool for me. Like, if you're not gonna get me high, I'm sorry. I have no interest in what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> but um, the thing is that I have no interest in that because I'm not after bulk muscle. Like, I want oh, lean okay. muscle. I, I want like. Like, uh, like the way G- I'm not saying I'm ever going to look this way. So fuck off everyone that already knows I, I want like gymnast muscle, like functional, good muscle. So if I had to like pull myself up on something, I can do it. No problem. You know, Rocky so four. Yeah. That's what you want to look like. Yeah. Rocky yeah. Rocky four where I'm like over the hill, but I still got a little bit in the bag. Yeah, nice. Tom, you end up with some of these female gymnasts ass. I'm touching it every time I'm up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I gotta say, look at me. I'm a, I'm a big pink sweaty mess today it's really hot over here in the uk it's been like 30 degrees for the last two days 30 degrees for the last two days it's fucking horrendous um and i don't like the fan on in the background when i'm recording so i I, i've been like sweating my balls off through this whole thing but i didn't want to have you're beautiful like a glistening god Oh, <laughs> absolutely not god i mean my blob uh that's what's like oh sadness you guys rock. Thank you so much for today. It has been an absolutely tremendous um, episode to record. Kenny, you have been fantastic and patient as well. Because I can yes. imagine like you had those, pay- those questions up there and I was kind of like, ooh, we're not going to have time for these. So I was like, Tom, hurry the fuck up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. And I'm, and I'm Message sorry, him Kenny. Today. Message him today and say, when can we do part two? He will do it. I guarantee it. He was a very, very cool guy, and he was he was such a good speaker. I, I, I want, as always, I get so surprised by the quality of guests, of people, of characters that fucking say yes to our awesome little show, and they, every single time they just knock it out of the park. I, I should never underestimate anyone ever again, apparently, because they just pull out the best. Absolutely. Um, and before we get out of here. Um, I want to say a very cryptic. We love you, Graham Arnold. I uh, can't say too much. It's a gray area. Um, it's gray. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. When, yeah. Wow. That was, I mean, that was just, that was a funny joke. I mean, it was funny, but it was like, because yeah. it's a gray area. It is a gray area. But yeah. We, I mean, by, by the time this episode goes, by the time something goes, by the time this goes out, um, you'll know what we're talking about. We just want to say we love you, Graham. Uh, yes. We'll always love you. And uh, yes. we hope you're well. Um, yes. and his family and friends as yes well. so anyway this has been uh, what's the difference uh, make sure you check out all of our shows available at yousuck.podbean.com um, we, go on. we didn't we didn't even ask fucking I'm sorry we didn't even ask DJ to do that we did not say hey give everything you do a shout out that's how fucking enamored we were by him. Fuck that. I dropped it. He'd have been like, Are you afraid of the dark? <laughs> <laughs> just just talked about it for an hour. The me, <laughs> you fuck some books. Um, all right. So, as Alex was saying, you should definitely fucking check out our podcast network on Podbean. It's under the You Suck banner. There's three fantastic shows that get uploaded weekly um, Superhero Bar Fight with uh, Jamie and Tom, where they talk about some really weird clash ups between characters and things that you would never anticipate we're going to fight, but they do. Um, we have the Weekly Bazaar, which is Shane Chepsey, Lucy Orchard, and our own Alex Whiteley, where they talk about the news and the craziest things that pop along the, you know, the UK aisle. Um, there is What's the Difference? The show you're listening to right this second with Al, Tom, and Kenny, where we fucking just kind of bring on our childhood heroes, apparently, or we just, well, you know, you. bring on who... You be a you. Me, yeah. Well, to be totally fair, they say yes. So I mean, like maybe more people in the British Isles just say yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I need to step up my game with this because I think that's we, we're hitting a niche now. It's kind yes. of nostalgic know, right? things. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, this has been what's the difference podcast. I've been Alex Whiteley. I'm Tom Bruno. 
And I'm Kenny Aldrich. Yes, you are. We fucking love yes, you guys. Fucking Catch you next week. Peace out.